Good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Judith Royer, and I am one of the Sisters of St. Joseph, the CSJs, uh, at Loyola Marymount University. I am also the director for the Center for Reconciliation and Justice at the university. So on behalf of the community sisters, the CSJ Center, LMU, and myself, I want to welcome all of you, family, friends, colleagues, center, uh, friends of the center, who are here today to help us celebrate these five uh, people that have been awarded as 2021 Hidden Heroes. Uh, Hidden Heroes program was designed to honor members from among the LMU and Loyola Law School faculty, students, staff, alums, and community partners uh, who are committed to social justice, service, and action. These are people who are hidden either because of the nature of the work that they do, which is sometimes under the radar, or as people who speak for those who are hidden in our world today, people whose voices are not being heard. So this is a good time to tell these stories or part of these stories of these people and the people with whom they are working and serving. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our really generous and dedicated committee for the selection of the Hidden Heroes. And I also want to, uh, to thank the people who nominated this year's awardees for committee consideration. I have one more note, and that is that when we play a recording on webinar, as we are doing today, the webinar may cause the sound, because it's a double recording, a, a double tech, uh, the sound from the original recording to go out of sync a bit with the webinar transmission. Depending on our, wi our transmission, your Wi-Fi, we have nothing that we can do about that. Uh, so if in advance you end up with that problem, sorry, um, the original recording is in sync and will be posted on the CSJ Center website eventually, probably by the end of this week. But in the meantime, if you are like me and you read lips a bit, I'd advise you to look at the eyes instead <laughs> because it'll drive you crazy. I would now like to introduce Doris Basley, who is our presentation editor for today's program. And she will talk to you a little bit about the somewhat unique nature of this particular recognition award program. Doris. Hey, thanks, Judith. Um, I'm a playwright and I'm a teacher um, here in the theater department at LMU. And since the first Hidden Heroes, which was, I think, 11 years ago, Judith and I have used a form we call dramatized narrative as a theatrical way to present the stories of our hidden heroes. We think of it as a kind of circle of communication that begins with one-on-one -on -one interviews with the storyteller, talking to a writer. And as the circle widens, the story transforms. It moves through the writer, out to the actor who's going to present it, and then finally out to a wider audience, which then brings it back to the storyteller. But now it's in a new context with new meaning. And the circle isn't completed until the audience receives it. And that's what you're doing here today to honor our awardees. In the spirit of widening this circle, I would like to acknowledge the Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, this land, the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. We are grateful to work in this place and we say their names to amplify their presence. And now here's Hidden Heroes 2021. Call 
college was never really in our sights. My parents didn't even finish high school. My dad asked me one time in the eighth grade if I wanted to go to college. I didn't even know what it was. I said no. <laughs> I've been lucky and privileged enough to go to Catholic school my whole life. So LMU just kind of seemed like a no-brainer, you know? My parents made a lot of sacrifices to be able to send me to private Catholic school. And because I didn't know about colleges, you know, with my upbringing, with my family, not knowing anything, I was kind of just following the flow of what my peers were saying. One of my best friends was like, I want to go to LMU. I've never heard of that. <laughs> Let's check it out. And of course, we visited and I fell in love with the campus. Like everyone else, it was beautiful and it was close enough to home that I didn't have to leave and it just seemed right. So I asked my parents, we talked about the cost and it's been very complicated. They initially only gifted me one semester at LMU thinking, okay, she's going to get it out of her system. She's going to get the whole college experience. And I wanted to stay in. Every semester after that was a battle. I ended up getting kicked out because I couldn't pay in 2015. I couldn't pay, but they were still sending me letters because they wanted me to donate. I took a two year leave of absence and came back in 2017. I took another year and a semester and then left Again, I came back in January 2021, and I just finished. I think because I was a first-gen person, I didn't really know how to ask for support. I didn't know what I was looking for. The finances were the only way I knew how to ask my parents for. But navigating the cost, understanding loans, they didn't know what was going on any more than I did. It was hard for us. As parents, the only time they've ever dealt with that kind of money was when they were buying a house, not going to college. And besides that, I don't think I really understood how to ask for any other support besides finances. In retrospect, it has been very difficult because no one in my family has been able to guide me. Like, Here's how you manage your time. Here's how you pick your classes. Here's how you pick a school. I don't even know how we got through it, but we did. My time outside of LMU was still spent in school. I went to Long Beach City and that was one of the best experiences of my life. I loved LMU. I fell in love with it the first time that I was introduced to it. But with the demographic, with the amount of privilege there, it really is being a bubble. LMU really pushes diversity. And of course, there's a small portion that is diverse, but it's not like my community college. I, I really needed that experience to snap me out of it. Like, hey, this is real life. That bubble's great, but that's not what it is. I feel like if you're a person of color, the lack of representation in media, in books, in everything, has led to a lot of uh, internalized racism. And it's just an assimilated idea of, of what you think your life should be. When I got to LMU, I was trying to fit in, trying to keep up with the Joneses. I wanted the whole college experience. Th that you would see in, in movies. Going to Long Beach City really changed that because my classmates were like 50 years old. Not only that, but my teacher was great. He was very raw with his teachings and he also happened to be Mexican, which was really important for me. I don't think I've had a Mexican teacher at that point or, you know, barely any professors of color at LMU. So it was really a good experience for me to have that sort of representation at Long Beach. In 2020, I lost my job because of COVID. It, I wasn't in school at Long Beach or LMU, and I just had a lot of downtime. Community fridge projects started to pop up, and my boyfriend and I decided to start one with our friend. A community fridge is a refrigerator 
like the kind that you would have in your kitchen. It's set up in a location that can be accessed by anyone. They're mostly set up outside of cafes and restaurants in LA, and they're open to the public. Our refrigerator is outside of Hot and Cool Cafe in Limert Park. It's in an alley, a very famous alley, and it's open 24 seven. Anyone can come and get any sort of resources that we have to offer at the time. We typically have in there water, eggs, juices, all kinds of veggies and fresh produce. The best part is when I see people bring things from their own garden, it's like made with love. <laughs> a lot of fruits, we will have milk sometimes, a lot of frozen pizzas, frozen breakfast sandwiches. That's just in the fridge. In the pantry, we have cans, mashed potato boxes, PPE. People donate hygiene products, menstrual products, masks, gloves, and clothes sometimes. I think fridge projects were a very tangible way that people could get involved. And I think that inspired a lot of people. The problem is with something like this, there's so much more than just donating. People don't really take the time to see that. And, and so what was happening was people were starting fridges and not taking care of them. It was about the rush of getting this cool thing started and then just no maintenance whatsoever. There was a huge lack of tapping in with the actual community that, was, that it was in. A lot of people wanted to set them up in gentrifying restaurants and stuff like that. And, and that was upsetting as someone from LA, someone who knows and loves these communities. We decided to start our own fridge in Limert Park, where my boyfriend's from. Limert Park is the mecca of black culture in LA. It has so much history and we said, let's start there. We can take care of it. We actually be the ones to know what's happening and we'll make sure the community members actually know what's happening with it. You know, obviously I'm not black. Even in my role of being an organizer for the fridge, I try to limit my own presence there because I recognize that it's not my space. The success of this fridge had everything to do with the Lemur community. It is entirely them. You know, we don't have money. We got the fridge donated to us. The first people to bring donations were community members. The reason why it stayed stocked is because of the community. I grew up in LA. I lived here my whole life. I've never seen another community together and take care of itself like Lemert has. And of course, it's not an accident. The black community has really had to take care of itself in this way. I think that care sh has shown itself and has extended into the fridge. It can be a sad reality working at the fridge. I have a lot of pride and joy being there and helping it run, but it's, it's not easy work. We have safety concerns, sanitary issues, it's hard to see people that you care for in tough circumstances. I had to learn that there's only so much you can do to help others. One of the hardest lessons that I had to learn was about need. I would spend weeks, days, months planning a giveaway. I was making sure we were crowdfunding so I could pay for a caterer to come, so I could pay for groceries to come, so I could create these hygiene kits spend all this time working, making sure there are over a hundred of each thing, only for these resources to be gone in 15 minutes. Like, if I say I'm, we're going to be out here from 12 to 3 p.m. and everything's gone by 11.45 while we're still setting up, the need never stops. And we did this in a neighborhood that was already suffering from lack of resources and care the fridge was originally a response to COVID, but it's not just because of COVID that people need these resources. If you look at job insecurity, food insecurity, housing insecurity, black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by these things. So when you throw COVID into the mix, automatically people are worse off. Our fridge became so relied on and we just, did not have the infrastructure to be able to maintain that level of need. And, you know, we held as long as we could. When you have black and brown volunteers that already fall prey to 
just life standards of having to work twice as hard as white folks and you're not paying them for this work and that requires a lot of time and physical presence to be there. It just doesn't work. We never really thought we'd make it past a month and we made it a whole year. And so we're really proud of the work. The last day it was in operation was Saturday, August 7th. And we had signs up for about a week. It was hard. It was hard and even after the fridge was gone, people were coming by that weren't on social media or didn't see the signs and they were asking, do you have food today? Where's the fridge? I'm sorry, it's gone. Is it coming back? No. That was hard. It was really, really hard. And after developing all these relationships with people that take care of the fridge, and not only donors, but we have team members that took from the fridge and fed their children. And you know, you develop relationships and you love them and it's hard. And then you think about it and it's like this, this is so common, you know? It's so common for black and brown communities to just experience this. Most Americans are like two paychecks away from homelessness. Need comes in all shapes and sizes, and it can really be overwhelming thinking about the state of the world and how that affects your own communities in the city that you love and the people that you love. The closure really took a toll on me, but I'm figuring it out. What comes next? I'm actually thinking of reaching out to this local library. I saw something on Twitter, it was a teacher she had this container of like lotions, pads, wipes, tampons, deodorant, snacks, just resources for her students. And it was really, I was really inspired by that. And it made me think, you know, if only more people did that, it's sort of like a mini fridge. You know, I, I love to start my story by telling you my family story. I'm the son of Mexican immigrants, one of 10 kids. Both my parents immigrated from Mexico and my dad first came here to the US in the 1950s as a bracero. That was like a, a labor agreement that the US had with the Mexican government. So it started during World War II they would send Mexican workers over to work the fields. And that's how my dad first came to the United States. In the early 70s, my father decided to bring my mom and brothers and sisters to the United States. And the first trip was a tragic one for my mom. She was making the journey along with my two oldest sisters and oldest brother. And on the way here, my sister Graciela got sick and died. She died along the way. So my mom returned back to her hometown, Jerez Zacatecas, to, to have a proper burial for, for Graciela. And my father couldn't attend because he was here illegally. But, you know, about a year later, my mother and brothers and sisters successfully crossed over and joined my father. So my mom and dad started to grow their family in a small little house in South Central Los Angeles. And I just feel that a lot of who I am today, just in my character and my faith and my love for the community, which I still live in, is in the area which I was born and raised. My oldest brothers, one is in the Marines and one is a police detective now. So I wanted to be a policeman. <laughs> I still want to be like him. He's, he's an amazing person. So I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So I majored in criminal justice at Cal State Los Angeles. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to be a policeman. But the Lord had a different path for me. 
One of my sisters uh, was teaching nativity school at our local Catholic school down the street. I was helping her move boxes into her classroom in July and the principal, Sister Judy Flahaven, asked me what I did for a living. I was out of work at the time, so I said I wanted to get a substitute teacher job and that if she ever needed any help, to please feel free to give me a call. So she called me in October and I helped her out for about a week, but then Sister Judy asked me if I was interested in teaching math and science. And I told her I love math and I love science. And I really love math, but not really science. But I mean, I was trying to get a job, so I was like, yes, of course, I'm an expert. And she trusted me. Can you believe it? She trusted me with no formal experience other than my four years as a teacher assistant. And she gave me the opportunity to be a full-time teacher at 23 years old. <laughs> Amazing. But the students, oh, they had a bet going whether or not I would make it to Christmas. They were used to teachers leaving and they took the credit for it. And I went back because I wanted to continue working, but also because I was like, I'm not going to walk away from this. There were so many kids there that needed me, and I wasn't ready to walk away quite yet. So I took the Christmas break and to really kind of gather myself. I told myself, I'm going to make it to Easter. And then I said, I'm going to make it to the end of the year. I was the fifth teacher, the fifth math teacher they had in three years. And I learned right away why. It was a tough eighth grade class, but you know, I still keep in touch with some of them. In fact, I'm their confirmation sponsor for a couple of them. Um, but Sister Judy, she, she was kind. She, she was so kind. She would allow me to work the summer to help our custodian get the classrooms ready for the year. And while I was there, she was always giving me little projects, asking me to look at some grant together with her. We would look at the curriculum together. So she was kind of teaching me what she did. I always thought if Sister Judy didn't become a religious sister, she would have been the first female president. Or she would have been one of the CEOs, uh, for a Fortune 500 company, Sister Judy Flavin, she is quite amazing. So, and then one day she told me, you know, you would make a great principal. I don't want to be a principal. I wanted to be a teacher for the rest of my life. But because Sister Judy said that, I believed it. And then she told me there's a program at LMU starting up. There's a program at LMU starting up for uh, teacher leadership preparation. And she said, I think you'd be good for it. And I mean, I didn't know, but I said, okay, sister, I'll apply for it. So I applied and I got called in for an interview for the program. But I already had a teaching credential and, and I didn't want to do it, but I decided to go and tell them in person that I can't do this, I'm no longer interested, but that I was grateful for the opportunity. So I get to LMU, and it turns out it's a group interview. And then they said, okay, the only thing you need to do now is submit your registration deposit. And I was like, yes, that's my way out, because I didn't bring my checkbook. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is a true story. I stood up and I said, okay, thank you guys. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't bring my checkbook. So I won't be able to do this program. So thank you. I'm grateful. Grateful for the opportunity, but thank you. Well, the young lady to my left says to me, don't worry. I'll write you a check. And I was like, but you don't even know me. Thank you, but you know, I couldn't accept. 
She and I are still friends till this day. And then the director pulled me over and, and talked to me about it. And she's still someone I really respect and admire. So I called one of my sisters and I asked her to drive over, please, and to please bring her checkbook. And she did it. And it changed my life from that moment forward. I was afraid of going back to school for two more years. I just wasn't sure. I was trying to keep my head above water as a first year teacher and, and I didn't want to leave the classroom, but, but God had different plans. He sat my colleague right next to me. I got my uh, credential as an administrator. I was still teaching math and science in Nativity Junior High. But over the years, Sister Judy kind of gave me different responsibilities. And, you know, it was like I was starting to believe that I, I could really do this, that I could really do this work. And then I heard that this is Sister Judy's last year. She's retiring this year. Oh, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, man, I feel bad for whoever follows in Sister Judy's footsteps. I would not want to be that person. Uh, she stayed for about seven or eight more years. Then one day she told me, Antonio, I think this is going to be my last year and I'd love for you to apply to be considered for the position. And I did. I got it. I was a principal there for five years. It was great. You know, probably my third year there as a principal, I remember the exact moment. It, it, it was during summer, and, and I never took summers off. And one day I can vividly remember thinking, you know, I may not go in today, but I went in. And I got a call from a parent, and... She told me that she really wanted to see me and that she needed to meet with me right away, as soon as possible. So she walks in and I finally recognized who the parent was. And she, she just didn't look herself physically. She, she was going through severe depression and she was expecting and I apologize, I get emotional when I talk about it. It's hard to tell a story without me thinking about it. She was weighing less than 100 pounds. This was a parent who I knew, who, who, who was very involved, who was very bubbly, very active, and, and, and always supporting the school. And then she just, and we talked and talked and for hours. But the last thing she told me was, I used to be an amazing parent. And then she started sobbing. Sorry. She felt so bad. So we walked over to the rectory and she talked to her parish priest and then throughout the entire summer I'd call her daily. That was the reason I was going in every summer, that summer. When I was tired, I, I would I would tell myself I gotta call her and I would and then and I would go in, I would call her and, and she would take my call. That was the first thing I did. I, I would call her, I would talk to her to her husband and sometimes things were better and, and other days she was struggling. And then time went by, the school year started and 
and more time went by. And one day she shows up she shows up to the school office with a car seat and a baby in the car seat. And she introduced us to little Tony. <laughs> we never talked about it again, but it was, you know, I always felt that that was that was the best thing I could ever do for a family. And in my mind, I would, I would, I would pretend that he's named after me. I used to tell her, hey, you know my goal, if I'm still here when he's, when he's in school, you know he's coming here, right? He's going to come here. But you know, the Lord, uh, the Lord calls us and gives us different paths. Sister Judy often talked about having the right people on the bus, and and I was lucky to get a seat on that bus. And then eventually she handed off the keys and I drove it for a bit. I was enjoying my life as a principal. I just got through accreditation and we got accredited, full accreditation for six years without any revisions. I was so proud of the work we were doing and the work we had done. And then, and then LMU reached out. And they reached out and said that they were looking for the for for a new director of their nationally recognized place core program. And I just felt like I was going where I was needed. And I still see it that way. I'm always I always thought I am where I am because that's where I'm needed now. So I always felt that that's why I'm there. That it was lining up and just kind of feeling that the Lord was still kind of just drafting my story. You know, the best thing that has happened to me in my life is my wife, Angelica, who has been my pride and joy and, and really just a pillar. We met when I was a TA at a local school down the street. Angelica was born in Mexico. But one of her sisters here had a high-risk pregnancy, and so they asked Angelica to come to help her. She got here on a Monday morning, and she went to pick up her nieces and little nephews from school in the afternoon to walk them home. My job was to make sure that nobody entered the parking lot. So I asked her nephew who that was that would walk him home. So we met on the first day here, on her first day here in the States. And we've been together since. That's why I said that uh, being a TA was the best decision of my life. You know, she had planned on staying for, for a few weeks, a few months. And uh, we eventually got married and we were able to fix her residency. For about 15 years, she wasn't able to go back home. It wasn't until Obama became president that he and his immigration reform allow us to petition from the States. And she didn't enter with a visitor's visa. She, she took the journey that many Mexican immigrants and other people from Latin American countries. So her journey wasn't an easy one. But we just celebrated our 20th anniversary from our first date. So 20 years ago since we've been part of each other's lives. And she's been there every step of the way. We have three kids. Amy, who's my oldest. She's a junior at uh, Bishop Kennedy High School. My boy Alejandro, who's a seventh grader now at St. Columkill. And then I have my youngest, Adrián, who's a first grader. You know, another reason that it's important that I share that story is out of nine of us, my parents sent eight of us to college. Five of us or teachers, or educators. And again, it speaks to what education means to the physics. 
I've always considered my parents. They are the primary reason. I think I feel that I have chosen a career in education. Because I feel that to this day, given all the years of education that I've had from pre-K to being a doctoral student, by far, they are my favorite teachers. Every decision I make, in every ounce of fiber, in, in everything that I share with the world about me, is because they shaped me and molded me. I am the man I am today because of them, because of my parents, because of their example. And, uh, you know, it's LMU's investment in me that kept me in Catholic education for so many years. Now, I'm on track to finish my PhD at the School of Education at LMU, May of 2022, if God wants. I will be able to finish it. I'm focusing on the retention and recruitment of Latino, Latina, Catholic school teachers. So it's something I'm really passionate about. Si Dios quiere. My mom always says that. Si Dios quiere. If God wants. In God's graces. So, you know, I think saying that, it's a big part of me. Si Dios quiere. I got flowers today. It wasn't my birthday or any other special day. One in three women, one in three, will experience domestic violence at some point in her life. We had our first argument last night. He said a lot of cruel things that really hurt me. But I know he was sorry and didn't mean the things he said because I got flowers today. It takes six to seven tries before a victim of domestic violence can leave the relationship. Why so long? Money, language, children, transportation, fear of courts, fear of DCFS, fear of police. Even with all of the services available, she will have to tell her story over and over to each provider. I got flowers today. It wasn't our anniversary or any special day. Domestic violence is still one of those issues that is just so crucial to our community. Last night, he threw me into a wall and started to choke me. It, it seemed like a nightmare. I couldn't believe it was real. I woke up this morning sore and bruised all over. I know he must be sorry because he sent me flowers today. I was first introduced to domestic violence about, uh, I wanna say 25 years ago at the shelter. I'd never even heard the words domestic violence. Of course, I knew women who were beaten up by boyfriends and husbands, but the thing about it, the way I was brought up was, Oh, she's bad luck. She didn't have good luck with that man in her life. That's how it was. I got flowers today. It wasn't Mother's Day or any other special day. I got together with several friends. There was myself. There was a friend of mine was a nurse. There was a friend who was a therapist. There was a friend who was an attorney. So we put together a little board and that's how we started. We decided Let's just open a nonprofit. <laughs> no money, no fundraising, nothing. We don't care about money. We're going to donate our time. And what we're going to do is uh, community outreach. Teach the community about domestic violence. And we came up with a little thing, like a, a directory on all the services. And then we're just going to offer that, you know? People come forward who say, I need help. We can reach our people there. Last night he beat me up again. And it was much worse than all the other times. I'm afraid of him and scared to leave. But I know he must be sorry because he sent me flowers today. 
I remember sitting by the computer this one particular day and feeling extremely tired. Like, oh my goodness, I've been answering a lot of calls. And so I went back to January, January to March, and I counted up to 300 calls or more. I stopped counting at 312 or something like that. I called my board and I said, you guys, we got to have a meeting here. This is serious, serious stuff. There's a lot of people out there who need help. Let's put it that way. And there must not be enough resources in the community or people that can help. That's why they're calling this number. And that's when we decided, okay, let's see if we can get a small little office somewhere and just have some therapists. Let's see what we can do with that. And that's also when we realize, well, wait a minute, who are these clients that are calling us? These are people come from different cultural backgrounds and they don't fit into the shelter. The shelter can't take them because, for example, if you don't speak English, you can't participate in the program at the shelter. So they are not served. They have no place to go. And that's when we hired a couple of therapists, one who spoke Arabic, uh, English, of course, but Arabic, and one who spoke Urdu. Diversity for us was right from the beginning. I got flowers today. Today was a very special day. Part of what happened at the same time was like, let's do a survey, right? And who do we have access to but our mosques? So we joined the women's group uh, because the women's group had a lot of outreach ability. And we joined with them and we had at the time, I think, um, 42 mosques. There are many more now. And so we created a survey with three questions. Simple as you can be. Do you ever talk about domestic violence in your yumya? You know, like uh, the Friday, like Sunday, but Friday for Muslims. And a couple more questions like that. And the results. I still have the results, by the way. They were shocking. I think 60% uh, said, oh, no, no, no. We don't have domestic violence in our community. <laughs> and then a few said, oh, yeah, once in a while, if we are asked, then we will address it. And very few, literally just a small handful, said that, you know, we address it once a year. One of our imams talks about this as in a sermon. And that's it. And as we were communicating with people of other faiths, they were saying the same thing. Oh yeah, we never talk about domestic violence in our church, you know? Like it doesn't exist, right? And so we have to stop that cycle of violence. That's important. So that's what this program eventually evolved to, to stop that cycle. New Star Family Center is a domestic violence agency, right? We can have all the services that we have under one roof because one organization can't do it. So we joined the uh, movement, <laughs> the Family Justice Center movement. Even some of my friends to this day, well, she can leave, you know? No. You can't leave. You have to, once you have children, especially with this person, well, how do you leave? The law says that both parents have equal access to the child. So you've got to meet up with this person every single time. And if he's an abuser, you know abusers, they continue to abuse. Even if they're not married to you anymore, they will find other ways to abuse you and make you feel that you are a victim for the rest of your life. It was the day of my funeral. Last night, he finally killed me. He beat me to death. So I wanted to, to let you know why I'm actually in this work. And that is for me, it's, it's very personal. I will never forget when I picked up the first woman, the first victim of domestic violence I personally took care of. And it was a lady with a child, a baby, who was born disabled, actually. And I picked her up in front of the apartment with two black garbage bags. All her belongings right in there. And uh, I just could not believe it. 
I could not believe a man would allow this to happen to a woman and a child. That woman today is successful. You ask, why didn't she leave? I ask, why did he hit? Just incredible stories to see how lives are destroyed by violence. And still, uh, we have a few men as well, but it's the women, it's us, the women, right? With all of our rights, with all of the things that we can do today, it is still the women and the children who suffer the most. But it's those stories that I really, if I can find a way to tell one or two, then that's what really makes my work kind of important, I think. Yes, that's what inspires me every single day. Honey, I know, I know, I know times are changing and it's time we all reach out for something new. That means you too. You say you want a leader, but you can't seem to make up your mind. I think you better close it and let me guide you to the purple rain. So I'm, I'm gonna be honest, honestly, I don't have some great story like, oh, I've always been passionate about. But the honest truth is what I was passionate about, but I'm not sure why, I always wanted to go to USC. Always wanted to go to USC, not UCLA, big USC fan. And I wanted to go and major in business. And that's what I did. I got my undergraduate degree in business, but I also love music. I love so much music. My mom loved music. I, I, Prince was my all time favorite. Huge Prince fanatic. I saw Purple Rain in the theaters nine times. When he died, whoo, that was a tough day. That was a tough day. I was at work. It's a hard, hard day. Everything just stopped. I, I went home and I just watched. I just watched. My husband came home. He said, what do you think you're gonna make for dinner today? And I looked at him and he said, oh, maybe I'll go over to Woody's and get some barbecue. And I said, good idea. So love music, but I don't have the talent, the music talent, like some people in my family. So I wanted to do the business part. And I got a summer job at A&M Records with a bachelor's degree. And a lot of the women, most of the women had bachelor's degrees and we were all secretaries. And the men had these VP jobs and director jobs and they didn't even have bachelor's degrees. And I just thought that was super unfair and inequitable. I'm all about equity. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go get a graduate degree and they won't be able to keep me as a secretary. I thought about getting the MBA. And then I thought about the law degree. The MBA, I almost went to, but then I decided if I get a JD, the law degree, I can still do business with the JD, but I can't practice law with the MBA. So I decided to go for the JD. Also like, I didn't come from money. And that was the other thing, right? Right? I don't wanna have to struggle. I don't think, my mother, my mother was a wonderful person. I always loved books. Ever since I was a little girl, I loved books. And my mom would always go buy us these golden books on Saturday. Every Saturday, I got a new book. Remember the golden books? <laughs> Every Saturday, I'd have a new book. And my brother had a set of encyclopedias. And we were 
having these encyclopedias, but they were like old. And you know, like I don't think my folks could afford a new set. So they were in the hallway on a bookcase and I would just sit in the hallway and read the Encyclopedia Britannica. And so my mom was a wonderful person. Everybody loved her, she was beautiful, but I never wanted to be that stay at home mom. You know, I always wanted to have my own. Also, I saw how some things didn't work out for her because she had to defer to my father and I never wanted that. I always wanted to have options. So to me, having options meant going to school and getting an education. And that's something they didn't have an opportunity to do. So I think, I think my mom is my biggest inspiration and a helper. She was a helping person. And I think I got that from her. So like I said, there was a struggle but for some reason, I didn't get caught up in the pregnancies. I was able, I, I knew how to take advantage of things. So dealing with students now feels like a different generation. I, I saw this when I was in career development. I still see it now often. And I'm not trying to be cliche about the helicopter parents, but the students come to us way needier than ever before. My mom didn't come to Loyola Law School campus until I was being sworn in. I have parents right now coming on tours, coming to orientation. I had a parent come to orientation. I'm not lying. She was at orientation. And I'm, I, I, I have parents calling me. And I'm like, okay. This is a professional school and we're training people to be professionals and advocates. And I, I would much prefer to speak to the student and I have the parents calling me. So, so let me see. Okay, so we were living in Atlanta. My husband was working in Atlanta and we lived in the suburbs for the schools. I stayed home for a couple of years. Uh, my oldest son has a disability. And I'd be passing by this junior high school and it said, paraprofessional wanted, inquire within. And it was like for special ed. And I think about it, I'd look at it and I think about it and then I say, nah. And then it would disappear. And then I pass by again maybe a couple of months later and it'd show up again. I think about it, then it'd be gone again. Third time I saw it, I thought about it and I stopped and I went in and I talked to the principal and I told him about my son and he said, but you're an attorney. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I have a son who has autism. I'd been a parent before and I'm also an advocate having attorney training. So I know how to advocate for my son and I figured, I'd be a good advocate for the students. So sometimes that put me at odds with the administration because I would want to tell the parents, this is what they should actually be giving the students. And that's really, that wasn't my role. And you know, but I did it anyhow. For me, I'm all about equity and, and making sure that that we're running the law school in a fair and equitable way. So if there's an issue with a student who wants us to make an exception, I want to give that same, I want to give that same time and consideration to that student who is first generation or who is of color or international that we would give to the same consideration to the student whose parents have written a big fat check. And if we're going to do an exception, if we weren't going to do that exception from that kid over there from Larissa, then why are we making it for John Q. Esquire, the third son? That's the thing that gets to me. I mean, it's like, 
I want to make sure that we don't have people who have this unfair advantage. I see that a lot with disability accommodations. I see a lot of students who really need it and can't take advantage of it because either they won't come forward or because they don't have the money to get the reports to substantiate their disabilities, right? So that part is super frustrating. And seeing some students who I feel take advantage of it. Yeah, you see a lot of these students coming from Beverly Hills with accommodations because they went to some Beverly Hills doctor and it's like, okay, they just got this just before taking the SAT. And so now they've got extra time for the SAT, they've got extra time for exams. And then there's a lot of students of color or students in first generation who feel like there's a stigma attached and, and they're reluctant to ask. And so I do try to talk to the BALSA students, Black Law Students Association, first gen students also. And I talk to them and I say, look, you gotta ask for what you need. You have to step up. So these are, these are some of the things I wanna do this year. I just got another staff person. She is the assistant director for student services diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a position they created for me. They just created this for me. And I told her, listen, I want you to have more interaction with some of these affinity groups. I want you to go to some of the meetings and I want you to talk to them about accommodations and tell them why they're entitled to them. And, and so we put together like a checklist, a check sheet, so that it's easier to understand what you have to do. So, so going to them because we can't, but it, it's been difficult getting them to come to us. What's great is being able to help. We've revised our disability accommodation process and made it easier for students. Dean Waterstone is a disability law specialist, so he was very supportive. He paid for a consultant to come in and review and audit our process, and I, I was very hands-on with that, and so that was, that was great. I have developed some really good relationships with students through that, and, I, and that's very rewarding. Also, we have these clinics, right? We have these public interest clinics at Loyola, and we have a lot of interest in those clinics. We have the Project Innocence Project. We have Immigration Law Project. Okay, we have education law, we have juvenile justice law, and they're just starting the Loyola Law School Anti-Racism Center. This is brand new. We didn't have those then. I never thought about red states, blue states, until we moved to Georgia. When President Obama was elected, oh my God, I went to work the next day and, and it was like somebody had died. It was incredible to me working with these educated people, right? And, and the reactions of these people. There were only a couple of us who were black and it was, it was so somber that day. And, and the couple of us who were black, we'd see each other in the hallway and we'd be like, hey! But everybody else was just like, I went home that day after work and I, I told my husband, I want to go home. I don't, I don't want to live in Georgia anymore. <laughs> then also, I think, I think the sad thing for me coming back to Loyola after so long, was seeing the number of minority students that had risen in terms of the Asian students and the Latin students, but not, not the black students, just the numbers the sheer numbers of students in school. So it's like, the struggle is real. I think it's the pipeline. It's the pipeline. It's setting our kids up for the pipeline. I think, first of all, you have to be able to see yourself. And I think for a lot of us, it's the money. You have to have the GPA to get in and you have to take the LSAT. And a lot of students are able to take these expensive preparation courses. And a lot of minority students don't. So the other thing for black law students or potential black law students, it's like the ones that do really well, like the ones everybody's fighting for them. 
So there's this group up here. Everybody's fighting for them. But like right here in the middle, the, the minority students, this is where we struggle. The white kids are being able to get in, but the black kids don't. And this is a struggle for us. I'm all about the underdog. I've always been about the underdog and, and wanting to see those kids succeed. And so I just think those kind of support systems, that that would be important to me, to have like more support systems for them. And I would, I would give the students back, the student org offices. It may seem trivial, but when I was in law school, Balsa had, we had our own office it, and La Rosa did too. And there was just something about coming out of con law, constitutional law, and, and being the only black person in the con law class where you're discussing Brown versus the Board of Education and separate but equal and, and you know, affirmative action and yeah, stuff like that. And, and you just want to go into the Balsa office and like, oh. I get encouragement though. I get encouragement. I, Dean Waterstone, yeah, he's the best. And my boss, who's associate dean, she's phenomenal. She's the most supportive boss I've ever had. Priya Schritterin. She's amazing. She's the one who pushed for my first promotion. She just kind of, she's been amazing, fantastic. That's one of the things that Loyola has. We've had so many women of color in the dean suite. And, and they do a really good job of that. We just hired a very entry level position in career development, an assistant. And it came down to two candidates. One was white and the other one was a young black girl who just graduated from Fisk. So the director was saying, well, the other girl, she's a little more polished and blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, we've been talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and bringing in more people of color into the pool and into employment here. I said, if we can't bring someone in on the entry level, where can we do it? Where can we meet these goals? So we ended up getting her. She's fabulous. We love her. It's amazing. This is her first professional job. So she's got to learn what it's like to be a professional instead of like being a student, you know, but yeah, she's been great. I think everyone loves her. She's really great for the office. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know. I, I, I wish I could say, I wish I could write it down for the students, what it was within me that got me to the point where I was able to go to undergrad, navigate that myself, succeed, then go to law school without having a blueprint from a family member or something like that, right? I wish I could write it down, pass it around, bottle it. And that's why I say in some ways, I was surprised to get this honor and I don't feel like I'm a person I'm not really involved in like professional organizations for higher education, that sort of thing. I'm just being me. And I guess I don't think of myself as like, yeah, I'm, this is something I'm really doing. I'm, I'm just doing it. <laughs> I'm just doing it. There is an amazing chart reader. She's one of these Latina rebels that I found on Instagram. According to my chart reader, I came to the world to have fun and enjoy. But then there's something in my stars that throws me into duty and I'm between both. Oh, my mom's painting. Isn't that amazing? My mom is an artist a painter, my father, an accountant. When I was born, they were super poor. Renting an apartment, they only had just a small bed. And when my mom was pregnant, 
my father would sleep on the floor. They had a thread that they could hang between two nails and that would be their wardrobe. They were very careful about how we would be, you know, protected from discrimination that they had suffered, the Jewish children. So that was the very beginning. And my mom found the maestro in Buenos Aires, Demetrio Uruchua, an anarchist painter. His murals are seen in Buenos Aires. She was so impressed by what he did. She didn't sleep two days. I have to study with this guy, you know? So we would travel to Buenos Aires, about 400 miles. My mom, me, my brother, with a roll of her paintings. And he would sit in this very old but big armchair. And the disciple would sit next to him. They would hang the work in front, and he would ask the artist, how is your health? And which meant, how is your work? How is your work true to yourself? Basically, he was reading her chart, all her personality, her traits, all what she was going through based on what her paintings were telling him. I would sit there and listen. At times, he was very rough. What you are doing here is imitating some other person. You are not being true to yourself. Well, once, I stood up and I told the maestro, my mom is not like that. So, all that I learned about being a writer, an artist, or creating, came as lessons in my very young years. My mom, so very supportive of anything I wanted to do in terms of art, writing. And I wanted to be an actor, you know. This is my class photo. It took me more than 50 years to act in a real play. In 2019, in Nepal, I played the memorist in the adaptation of my book, The Little School. Oh yes, I have many copies of this. I'm using this as my mouse. <laughs> I wanted to be a doctor, a real doctor. Not like now, I'm a doctor who doesn't cure people. I was going to Buenos Aires because there was no medical school in my hometown. And what happened was that I fell in love with my first husband and I didn't believe in love at a distance, so. I just studied literature in my hometown and my father was devastated because he wanted me to be a doctor. He wanted me to be a Nobel Prize winning. There is a lot of sense of the absurd that I think comes from the kind of Jewish humor. My grandfather with the greatest sense of humor Naidenaum, you know, he was an immigrant, escaped the pogroms. And when we were visiting, he spent quite a bit of time with us. He would teach us games. In my dissertation, I compared the writing during the Holocaust with the writings created in prisons and concentration camps in South America and by the relatives of the disappeared. So, well, there is no recipe for survival. I, I was disappeared in the secret detention place for three and a half months in the little school, La Escuelita, and two more months in prison in my hometown, Bahia Blanca. And then they transferred me to the big prison in Buenos Aires, 800 women, mostly survivors of these secret detention places. And this is what we were doing. Even in the little school, I have my friend Basta. Basta. I talk about her and all the jokes, all that humor that she had too. And it was, I mean, she was my hero because she was certain, and I was certain too, 
that they were going to kill us. But the thing is, we kept until the last minute this idea of, okay, so what if not? And so when the time came to testify in this trial against the genocide perpetrators, that the one that finally sent them to jail, I found myself saying, we were working together. We were still activists while we were there. We were putting together this information in case one of us survived and we could tell. So, for us, I mean, this concept of hero seems to be very different than the concept of hero here in the States. Hmm? For us, heroes are generally dead. Yeah. <laughs> So it's funny. When I told my husband about this hidden heroes thing, he says, are you hidden? And I'm not that hidden. I'm better known maybe outside LMU than at the university. I am in the modern languages department in Spanish. So that makes us a little less visible in terms of our work as authors. Arte Poetica, the art of poetry. Eso que vuele bajito es mi poesía. That which flies low is my poetry. Rastreadora de olores dentro del pasto. Yo no busco la altura. Dredging the odors deep within the grassland, I don't look for height. Vertigo of soaring. Vertigo el vuelo. He visto la distancia volando bajo. I assault the distances flying low. Allí está la palabra, olvidadita. There is the word, the sweet and forgotten one, fresh and with roots or redolent of fear. Fresca con las raíces, oliendo a miedo, torna soleándose algo como la carne cadáver que transita a la semilla. Iridescent thing, like the meat, of a cadaver turning into seed. Flying low. Yeah. In Spanish, in my culture, it means um, not to be noticed so they don't kill you. And solidarity. My dissertation is called a Discourse of Solidarity in Poetry Collections in Argentina, Chile and Uruguay. There is this poet I always quote, Cecilia Vicuña, from Chile. She said that words can be opened and she sees in the word solidarity in Spanish. So is son and dar it is to give, to give son. That's what keeps me alive, I think. It's literally what kept me alive because people... You asked me about heroes and I said that they had to be dead, but no, my heroes are the mothers and the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, of the disappeared. They are the survivors the mothers of the girls, the women killed in femicide in Ciudad Juarez, Veronica de Negri, she was disappeared and tortured, came into exile with her children. And then her son, when he was 19, he went back in search of his roots to Chile. And the military, they burned him alive while he was photographing a demonstration and she won't stop. She is a fierce warrior for social justice. I admire what a woman can do after she suffers this loss and still continues fighting and struggling. So people like her, and it's usually mothers. I know the mother started to march while I was disappeared in April 1917, 
and I credit them with my survival. I mean, they called international attention to what was going on. They risked their lives. Some of them were disappeared too. The hero for me is this collective construction. The people who give me strength to continue are survivors. And I mean, you might see me as somebody very special, but if you see all these, mostly I'm in touch with women survivors and their stories and their struggles. They're so empowering. I mean, they teach you so much and they give you so much energy. Then you cannot pity yourself, right? Because it's all, there is a community out there Visiting the occupied territories back in 87, old Jerusalem, the first intifada. That's when I see myself transitioning from victim to witness. We were a woman's delegation. We witnessed things. We were, they, they were throwing tear gas that produced miscarriages inside the refugee camps. Very cramped places. This is a picture with the kids in the refugee camp. And you'll see my face. It's like I am the foreigner who comes and gets shocked. And what stayed with me for the longest time was I didn't do enough. We went to this hospital. We talked to the people. And when we left, the soldiers came and beat them up. So we were like, we caused this. We were feeling guilty. And that's when I realized, no, they were the guilty ones. We were trying to make this situation less invisible. So that's when I realized, as a witness, what I can contribute to the witness movement. And so we, with my husband, we started an organization called Proyecto Voz, Voices of Survivors. I realized that survivors were made to talk many times, just for free, because the assumption was that, oh, we want to help by telling. So they are helping by listening. But we were leaving our families, hiring babysitters, not working, and Oliver North, was charging speaking fees. I was vice chair on the board of directors of Amnesty International USA. I realized it was not fair. So the concept was okay. Universities, they can pay fees for survivors to talk and this money they can take home and continue their work. No se puede vivir con una muerte dentro. Hay que elegir entre arrojarla lejos como un fruto podrido o al contagio dejarse morir. Alaida Fopa. No one can live with a death inside. You have to choose between tossing it far away like a rotten fruit or keeping it and dying from contamination. Alaida Fopa. Dialogue with Alaida Fopa. Theologo con Alaida Fopa. Busco el espíritu de esta mujer y encuentro su amor por las manzanas, su ansiedad de las alelías sobre el pecho. I tried to find the spirit of this woman and discover her love of apples, her lust for holding gilly flowers to her heart, five children needed by her body. Los cinco hijos que amasó su cuerpo, su cuerpo, desgajado en la tortura. Her body ripped apart by torture. A la ida of ideas and of flying. A la ida de alas y de ideas. 
cuando arrojo lejos de mí tu muerte, se vuelve proyectil por la justicia. When I toss your death far away from me, it turns into a meteor of justice. I've thought a lot about how to tell their stories, right? Because my area of expertise is testimonial writing. So it was kind of funny when a Professor Royer was explaining what you were going to do with me. So I have some theories there, right? Scholars go and study survivors as objects, basically, not as subjects. We write about them, we study them, and we deliver our papers. Where is the voice? The experience of the subject. So what I am saying is bring the subject to the table. Now we have Zoom. They say, oh, this subject is in Mexico. She can go where there is a computer and she can talk to your audience with you. So I was working to bring over 41 people on Zoom, paying them, survivors and poets. So I had the opportunity I learned about simultaneous interpretation on Zoom. So I had people, and it's expensive. They gave me a good deal, but I hired these women who were amazing. So I put together survivors from Mexico, Guatemala, uh, Argentina, Chile, and Nepal. So there were Latina poets from all the Americas. And my students were translating their works and reading to them their English translations or Spanish translations. I mean, my students were freaking out. How are we going to translate to so? But it went very well. And I did one where I put together all the translators and publishers of the little school. And so that was a treat for me. And then I did a third one where I had poets, Latina, 40 in their 40s. So that's my future plan. An anthology with women in their 40s. It's a trick there because my daughter is in her 40s and I thought, well, it's sort of a passing of the baton, right? But the thing is, um, when I say there are no recipes for survival, right? I guess more than the sense of humor is the sense of happiness about life. Because what the torturers wanted, it, what torture is meant to do is to destroy human beings. And with that, any traits that keep us going in life and then I think we might not have more sense of humor than the rest of people, but <laughs> for them, you become someone who will illuminate. You will teach everybody how to survive. I mean, you have the tips, you have all the know-how, because how did you manage? And it's not easy, but you just look around you to see what you can do. And you know, we are wounded in different ways. And we all have post-traumatic stress syndrome. We do pretty much, but uh, I know when I'm not when I'm in trouble emotionally, well, it's when I cannot laugh. I know that when I cannot make fun of myself, when I take myself too seriously, I know I'm in trouble. But a sense of humor, it helped. It helped while we were political prisoners. It still helps. You should see a bunch of us getting together and it's crazy, the things that we laugh about. But the concept of reconciliation with the torturer, with the killer, that's not something that will help me. 
It helps people. It helps other people. It doesn't help me. What I want is for these guilty ones to be sent to prison and to pay for the crimes they committed. But I think the way that it might be useful is that we have reconciled with ourselves. After all they've done to us, after we've seen ourselves in the worst places as human beings, and uh, sometimes some people have been so broken to levels in which they had to do things that they regret all their lives. And that's another of the purposes of the torturers. There is a book called The Body in Pain by Elaine Scabby. And the way regimes that use torture make even the things that are most dear to you or the things you trust the most untrustful, something to be scared of. The, the place where we would disappear was called the little school, right? A school is a place to learn. The society trusts the schools and so they destroy. The machine they used to torture people in my country, they call it parija. Parija means barbecue pit. So my country is, uh, well, <laughs> a country where barbecue is glorified. It's like, it's uh, like the way we socialize. We can eat a lot of beef. So then the parilla is the torture thing and is what we like the most, the moments of pleasure with friends or around this barbecue pit. And so it's like your voice which defends you and protects you. It becomes an instrument against yourself because you are forced to say things in that voice that are incriminating to you and friends. They are things that are not saving you. See? That's how reconciliation could be applied to this. If they could reconcile with themselves, with that person, at that moment. I realize oftentimes I try to do too much. I, I try to do much more than what I can do. I mean, I plan. It's like I have these huge plans and then I have to adapt and learn with age and also to listen to people. So I have to work on that. Yeah, you know, we Aquarians, we want to be everything. And we end up being poets. <laughs> the need never stops. When I say there are no recipes for survival, right? I guess more than the sense of humor is uh, the sense of happiness about life. I don't know what it is. I, I, I wish I did. I wish... I wish I could write it out and pass it around. Bottle it. It's not easy, but you just look around you to see what you can do. And you know, we are wounded in different ways. We are just going to offer, if people come forward who say, I need help, well, we can reach our people. I just felt like I was going where I was needed. And I still see it that way. I am where I am now because I'm needed where I am now. And, and I don't think of myself as like, yeah, this is something I'm really doing. I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. Alicia Partnoy. Linda Whitfield.
Elena Maloney. Antonio Felix. Abigail Magallanes. Good afternoon. I'm Sister Mary Ann, Associate Director of the CSJ Center. I hope that you, family, friends, and colleagues all have been moved and inspired by the lives and contributions of our honorees today as I have. Now to continue our celebration on behalf of the CSJ Center, it gives me great pleasure to present each honoree with an original tile designed by one of our sister artists, Ellen O'Leary. We believe that the sentiments expressed in Sister Ellen's description of the piece convey why we hope this gift will be a lovely reminder to each recipient of this special day. So in Ellen's words, the tapestry symbolizes your life. The weaving of the colors reminds you of the people woven in your life that you have touched and those who have influenced you. The gold spaces are those moments when your heart has expressed great compassion and service. You have blessed our planet and yet the tapestry is not finished. May your continual presence express the beauty of your person. So now the presentation to each of our honorees who will also have a chance to say a few words. Antonio Felix. Thank you, everyone. And first of all, thank you to Catherine and Carlos for your um, storytelling and, and portrayal of my family story. Although I could think of so many people who are deserving of this beautiful award and recognition, I'd like to once again highlight the 2021 Hidden Heroes who are doing amazing work but also accept this and share this with all of my colleagues and friends in the School of Education, my place core and CAS graduate students, Sister Judy and the sisters of Dorn Dane and Amor, my best friend, Father Freddy Rosales, my parents and my brothers and sisters, my Tia Mati who is watching from heaven, 
my wife Angelica, along with my kids, Alex, Amy, and Adrian. Lastly, I would like to honor my grandparents who are also watching from heaven, Pascual and Angela Felix, and Juan and Concepcion Rodriguez. Thank you all, so grateful. Thank you. Abagail Magallanes. Thank you so much to Alyssa for nominating me. I am very honored to share the story of Limerick Park. I think um, the one takeaway I hope everyone gets from this is that it is so important to take care of the community that you are involved in, um, in the city that you come from. And if that's if you live in somewhere that you weren't born in, take care of that city as well. I think um, for, black and brown, but I'll say black community specifically because that's what Limer is, recognize the amount of work that it takes to be able to just keep up with everybody else. And um, I really wanna note that anyone can do this. It's, I, I was not an organizer before this moment. Um, I learned just along the way and um, yeah, you can, you can do it with hard work, but really trust in the community they'll tell you everything that needs to be done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Elena Maloney. Elena, you're on mute. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored to be here today to receive this Hidden Heroes Awards. Um, I would like to uh, thank the people at, at LMU who made this possible, uh, Professor Amir Hussein, Chair of the Theology Department, who nominated me, uh, Kenan Twell, Director of the Muslim Student Life, uh, mm -hmm. Sister Judith Royer, Director uh, just, who uh, surprised me with the call, um, and all of the CSJ sisters. Uh, Julianne Homake, who spent much time interviewing and writing up the script um, for the program. Um, Stephanie Meja and all of the other people who work behind the scenes. Uh, I also would like to state that although this is a personal award, um, it is and will always be as a result of the dedicated teamwork of the family of the Mustar Family Justice Center, from the board members to the uh, to the staff that comes in every single day, uh, to the volunteers and donors who support the work. It is because of them that uh, I'm that this day is made possible for me. Um, for me, the most important thing uh, about this award is to hopefully bring more awareness to the issue of domestic violence, also known as intimate partner violence or family violence. Um, you heard the stories. Uh, you heard the story of how I came uh, into this work, but even today, a lot of people are not aware of the negative consequences or the negative impacts that domestic violence has on families and communities. Um, we may see a homeless woman on the street and not realize that she may be there as a result of having fleeing in abusing, an abusive situation. So, um, uh, October is actually the perfect month to receive this award as we uh, commemorate Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Our campaign this year, it's called Finding Hope. Uh, uh, each week we release an email uh, that highlights a type of abuse so as to educate the community. Uh, and also a client will tell her story from her, with her own words. You can view this on our Facebook. Uh, I highly encourage all of you to volunteer as advocates with any agency that serves domestic violence, uh, victims of domestic violence, so that your engagement can contribute towards solutions to the issue. Um, of the, uh, on the, um, one of the lines in the inscription uh, stood out for me. It says, the tapestry is not finished. So tomorrow is Monday. I will be going back to my work and you to yours. What I hope for is that the presentation you heard today has touched your hearts. And over time, as some of us will be stepping back, some of you will step forward 
to continue weaving this tapestry of life. I'm truly grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. And thanks to you. Alicia Partnoy. Um, I'm, I'm extremely humbled and moved. Uh, I want to, I'm inspired by the stories. Um, I'm inspired by the other participants and especially with this amazing award that makes such a great use of the arts and uh, in, the, in the spirit of um, the Sisters of Orange. And uh, I want to thank Gail Broski for nominating me. I want to thank my parents who are watching uh, in another room. I can hear them talking and trying to translate all what is going on here. Mama, Papa, un abrazo muy grande. And uh, just, uh, I think all that I could have said was uh, summarized by the amazing writer, uh, Beth Ruscio. We, uh, it was a treasure to be able to meet her. And uh, Rose uh, Portillo, I, I'm, I'm really um, so moved by your performance. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thank you. Linda Whitfield. Thank you, sister. And thanks to the CSJ Center for this honor. I want to say thanks to Bonnie Banfield for writing and performing my story. Um, thank you, Dean Michael Waterstone, for the nomination. I really appreciate that. I appreciate working with all of my colleagues at the law school and the university. I want to say congratulations to all the other honorees. Um, I want to say thanks to my boss, Priya Shritharan, um, for pushing me forward, for sharing her post-it notes, and for being my friend. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank my family, Lance, um, Nikolai, Ryan, and Brenda. Thanks for supporting me so much. That's all. Thank you, Linda. Because of our virtual format, we're not able to celebrate with you in an outdoor reception. We've mailed each of our recipients a gift certificate to enjoy a meal with their loved ones. Please enjoy yourselves and know that we're all celebrating with you in spirit. <laughs>